Happy Monday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. I'm your host, John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. Well, it is still the month of Halloween, and we are continuing our trend of looking into Halloween-related cases. It's kind of tough because I always think of Halloween as kind of a happy time of year, decorations, candy, children. But in these cases we're looking at... um, they're just there's tragedy and it's sometimes brutal and it especially breaks my heart when it involves children. I'm hoping that not only can we learn using the kind of typical case cracked formula of how these cases get solved and maybe we can apply that to other cases, but outside of that I'm also helping that maybe there's some lessons here that we can learn for keeping ourselves and our children safe. So Christy has been hard at work on another one. This is a case, just another heartbreaker, um, but it's called Taylor's Last Halloween. 18-year-old Taylor Van Deest's favorite holiday was Halloween. It was October 31st, 2011 in the city of Armstrong, a small rural community located in the British Columbian province of Canada. For Halloween this year, Taylor was doing something different. She planned to go trick-or-treating with her friends instead of going with her twin sister, Kirsty. After carefully applying fake bruises, cuts, and blood to her body and clothes for her zombie costume, she exchanged a few text messages with her boyfriend, who wasn't planning on going trick-or-treating. She also texted the two friends she would be with that evening and agreed to meet up at a designated spot at 6 p.m. Hurry, Zoe Zoe's on her way. We'll meet you at your place, Taylor wrote. At 5.45 p.m., she set off on foot, but instead of waiting for her friend Zoe so they could walk over together, she decided to take a shortcut by the railroad tracks and she would try to catch Zoe on the way. By 6 p.m., Taylor had still not made it to the designated meetup spot, and more concerning is that she was texting her boyfriend saying that she thought she was, quote, being creeped by someone in the shadows near the tracks. Worried, her boyfriend and a friend's mother tried to text her back but received no reply. As more time passed and Taylor's phone went unanswered, everyone decided that a search party was in order. By 7.30 p.m., her phone had been found by the railroad tracks, but there was still no sign of Taylor. It was then decided that the RCMP should be called. After officers arrived to help with the search at 8.45 p.m., family and friends found Taylor. Her bloodied, unconscious body was in a bush near a railway crossing less than a kilometer from her home. Helplessly, her friends placed their jackets over her body to protect it from the chilly October night. Her mother, a care aide, held her as she whispered, fight it, you're going to make it, you're going to survive. Taylor would be taken to Vernon Hospital, but... Her injuries were life-threatening, and they decided to transfer her to Kelowna Hospital. It was there that, unfortunately, Taylor passed away. In the interest of preserving the integrity of the investigation, officers considered the autopsy report and results to be, quote, holdback evidence. Right now, the only people who know the full details of this death are the pathologist, a few investigators, and the person or persons responsible for this crime, stated RCMP spokesman Gord Melendic. The only details they would allow to be known publicly were that marks around Taylor's neck were consistent with being strangled and that she had also received several blows to the head. Investigators then appealed to the public for any details about Taylor's day from noon until 8.45 p.m. At this point, we don't have any idea on a suspect, Melendic stated. Flyers were circulated that not only showed Taylor in her street clothes, but in the Halloween costume that she actually wore that night. Taylor had put up a fight, scratching her attacker. The trauma nurse who attended to her had taken her fingernail clippings as samples. It would not be long before investigators had a DNA match from Taylor's body and a composite sketch to show the public. Investigators were able to connect the sample to two assaults from 2005, In both of those cases, the victims were lucky enough to survive and gave investigators plenty of information about their attacker. One of those victims thought she might even know who the attacker was. With the DNA sample from Taylor matching one of those two other victims and the third victim's information about it being someone she may have known, 
investigators were able to quickly narrow down the identity of their killer. It was local resident Matthew Forrester. But when police went to the home he shared with his father, Stephen Forrester, they learned that Matthew was no longer living there, but now working on oil rigs somewhere in the north. Stephen had bought his son a new identity, including a BCAA card, driver's license, an old bank card, and an SIN, or a social insurance number, kind of like the social security numbers we use here in the U.S. He also obtained stuffers, receipts, and other items to simulate what a person would carry in their wallet, making the lie even more authentic. The RCMP set up audio surveillance at Stevens' home and placed a GPS tracker on his vehicle. Over the next six months, police would intercept three phone calls between Stephen and Matthew, who they found out was actually hiding in Collingwood, Ontario. On March 25, 2012, investigators intercepted the first call. They talked about Matthew Forrester using his new identity. They spoke about the police investigation into the murder of Miss Van Deest and... They spoke about ways for Matthew to avoid detection as well as Mr. Stephen Forrester making arrangements for what he called new papers for Matthew. Crown counsel Chris Ballison said. Mr. Forrester tells Matthew that they, meaning police, came and saw his mother at work again. Stephen Forrester reassured Matthew by saying they, obviously meaning the police, don't know where you're at. They also discussed switching the fake SIN numbers around. It seemed the person they had bought the number from was complaining and having second thoughts. Stephen Forrester told Matthew they were warned by someone that the kid Matthew got the identity from was talking, not to the authorities, but he was talking around town, Mr. Ballison said. He told Matthew the cops were at the house again and that it wasn't going away. The next call came just a day later, when Matthew tells his dad he is concerned about the price he's paying for the new identity and assures his father that he will pay him back. Matthew had to leave his job at a glass manufacturing plant. It seems that someone there noticed that there was something wrong with that SIN number that he had. Matthew got a painting job instead. Stephen stated that he had found a tracking device on one of the family cars and removed it. He also thought they should get rid of their cell phones, but then backtracked saying if the police knew where Matthew was, they'd already be there. Just two days after that last phone call, both men were arrested, Matthew in Collingwood and Stephen in Cherryville. In the trial that followed, the sad details of Taylor's last night would come to light. Forensic pathologist John Stefanelli testified that she was choked and hit hard on the head six times by a flashlight and that one of the blows was hard enough to fracture her skull. Mr. Stefanelli said the 18-year-old had marks on her neck that indicate she was strangled with something long and thin, such as a piece of string, a necklace, or a cord. She had also broke a finger and had bruising on her hands from trying to fend off the attack. Mr. Stefanelli said it was blunt force trauma from the blows to her head that caused the injury she died from just a few hours later. Stephen Forrester was sentenced to three years in jail for helping his son avoid detection following Taylor's murder. During the court proceedings, he was given the opportunity to speak. Quote, I would like to apologize to the Van Deest family for prolonging the investigation, Stephen said quietly. They have suffered more than anybody should. His defense lawyer, Joe Dooling, said his client's life had unraveled over the past couple of years. His marriage died with those charges, and he was forced to sell his home in Cherryville to pay his legal counsel and to also get his family out of debt. Dooling said Stephen's actions made the whole situation more difficult for the Van Deest family, for the police, and for the community in general, but insisted that he could be rehabilitated. Marie Van Deest, Taylor's mother, hoped the sentence would be closer to five years, but said it's better than no time. She had little compassion for Stephen Forrester's decision to protect his son. I think they are both cowards and deviants, and neither one of them have a place in society. I'm glad Stephen will be out of society for a while, but it makes me shudder that he'll be released one day soon. Matthew Forrester was charged with Taylor's murder, even though he claimed that he had never intended to kill her. He stated that things got out of hand when he tried to have sex with Taylor and she fought back. 
His story would soon fall apart when a taped police interview was played in which he admitted to hitting Taylor multiple times with a maglite flashlight and choked her with a shoelace. He said he was looking for sex that night when he saw Taylor by the railroad tracks. He said he spoke to her for what seemed like a few minutes before the al- the altercation. I pushed her down and I just told her to keep quiet and she wouldn't listen. I freaked out and I took off. I was scared when I realized what I had done. I shouldn't have never been there. I felt terrible for how everything worked out since then. If I could, I'd take it all back, Matthew stated. After multiple witnesses were called, Matthew would finally admit to causing the injuries that killed Taylor. Because he pled not guilty, but admitted to causing the injuries that led to Taylor's death, a jury found Matthew Forrester guilty of first-degree murder. In Canada, a first-degree murder verdict carries an automatic life sentence with no parole for at least 25 years. For the two earlier assaults, Matthew was sentenced to six years to be served consecutively with his life sentence. Outside the courthouse, the victim's father, Raymond Van Deest, said it was horrific to sit there and hear how his daughter suffered. I hope she was unconscious and she didn't have to suffer, he said. I would have rather gone through that than her. I would have rather been there and not her. Case Cracked. Thank you to Global News, The Vancouver Sun, Kelowna Daily Courier, Infotel, CTV News, CBC News, The Times Colonist, Huffington Post, ABC News, Wikipedia, The Globe, and Mail.com, The Daily Mail, and Castanet.net for information contributing to today's story. This is one of those stories where, yes, we have the case cracked. Yes, we have justice arrive. And it just doesn't feel like enough. Um, this is an 18-year-old. Life is just getting started. Her family will forever be affected by this. Sometimes I wonder, is it enough to, to stick people in jail? I mean, shouldn't there be some other type of repercussions or uh, benefits for the families that are going through this? I mean, this could be, probably is a lifetime of therapy, um, a lifetime of a broken heart and I don't know. It just it. I really wish that there was more, um, or or a different way that people could pay that was more substantial than just locking them up in a box. Sometimes, um, there is some follow up notes on this. Now there is a memorial trail. Uh, Taylor Jade Van Deest Memorial Trail marks the place that Taylor was killed, but it also symbolizes the community's resilience to the darkness that fell there Halloween night 2011. Her sister, Kirsty decorates the trail for every special occasion and holiday, a heart on Valentine's Day, an ornament for Christmas. Quote, we bring the holidays to her, her mother Marie says. Every year since her death, her family has held a memorial walk and candlelight vigil. However, they had to make the walk of November 1st, 2016, their last one, because the stress of reliving that tragedy yearly has apparently become too much. And that's one of those things, that's what I'm talking about. Um, They know that justice is served, they know the guys are sitting in jail and they still have to live with what they did for the rest of their lives. Um, And that's what just just makes me wonder if it's enough. Now on top of all that, we have a, a little wrinkle in terms of the law around this. There is an appeal that is filed on March 6, 2017 by Matthew Forrester and his legal team. They're basically appealing his conviction on five different grounds. A three-judge panel found that two of those grounds, uh, specifically relating to how the judge charged the jury, essentially the instructions that the judge gave to the jury, were sufficient enough to overturn the verdict and order a new trial. However, before the new trial, Matthew took a plea deal, pled guilty to second-degree murder, He's still sentenced to life in prison, but he can now apply for parole after only 17 years. Um, Thankfully, it's only applying for parole. I don't know if he'll get out. Uh, I hope that they'll look at the conditions of the case. They'll talk about the fact that this is an 18-year-old girl, um, and maybe it won't be enough that he's been good for a number of years to get him out. I, I just... 
I don't know, with cases like this, um, and admittedly, yes, she's 18, but in, in my eyes, um, she's still practically a, a child. Um, I really wish that the penalties would be stiffer. What do you guys think? Do you think for a crime like this that he should be eligible for parole after only 17 years? Let's talk about in the comments down below. Obviously, I've shared my thoughts with you guys, but I want to see what you think, um, in particular about a case like this. It just, uh, I don't know, it really gets at me how youth is abused and robbed in instances like this. It, it just, it breaks my heart. There is no second chance in an instance like this for Taylor. So why should there be a second chance for Matthew? I, I don't know. Big thank you to uh, supporters via PayPal, Rita Maria Wanninger, Randy Volkel, Jennifer Wilson, and Michael Park. I really appreciate your guys' support month after month. If you would like to join them and support the channel, you can do that by visiting www.lordandarts.com. We've got links there for PayPal, Patreon, merchandise, the audiobook. All of it helps keep me here sharing time with you guys, sharing these stories, and hopefully... We're all learning from them in some way. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new episode of Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel.